Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the premiere show of Uncle Jackie's Gumbo, which is a little bit of this and a whole lot of that. Today, what we're going to be doing is a few things. Each show is going to start with some kind of recipe. Today, we're, today the recipe that we're going to be discussing is a seafood gumbo. And it's uh, a traditional seafood gumbo made with okra. Okra is the African word for gumbo. It's thick and gooey as opposed to, let's say, uh, a chicken and uh, andouille sausage gumbo. But before we get into that, I want to play you a little ditty on perhaps what is the world's smallest harmonica. I bought it in Washington, D.C. years ago when I was on um, Hurricane from Katrina. It was a little toy store, and it's a honer. It's one inch long, and here's a little ditty to get your day started and along with the show. It's got four holes in it, so it's limited, but here, here we go. Okay, there we go. The show started. Uh, before we get into the recipe of the seafood gumbo, here's a reflection. You know, when I was a kid, quite a few years ago, um, the sci-fi movies were inundated with movies that dealt with dinosaurs. And when we were kids, we were fascinated with dinosaurs, with Godzilla and big, gigantic mammoth creatures walking the face of the earth. We've always wondered, like, okay, these, these big and powerful mammoth animals, gigantic dinosaurs, I mean, taller than skyscrapers, what ever happened to them? Why did they go extinct? There's been several theories. One I heard was that, um, okay, they ran out of vegetation. They just ate all the vegetation and they didn't have anything else to eat. Another one was that the uh, volcanoes erupted and took all the oxygen out the air. So that killed them. The other, which is probably more credible than anything else, is the fact that over across the United States, and of course other parts of the world as well, uh, there were five glaciers, five entire huge massive glaciers covered the face of the United States. At one time, the United States of America or America, or this land, this continent that they were, we're on, was like nothing but mountains and boulders and rocks. But one by one, over millions of years, the glaciers came down from the north. Now, we don't know if that happened because the earth tilted on its axis and um, made the equator belt go down, therefore, like the North Pole came down along with the... Uh, with the glaciers, or if the, the glaciers just came down. But we know it's documented that there were five of them. I'm going to go with that theory because that makes more sense. Because uh, underneath the rocks, there were always, uh, particularly up in the Midwest, um, Idaho, Oklahoma, they're always uncovering dinosaur bones. And so it, it would make sense that the glaciers came down that way. And if you notice, like, if you've ever been to Oklahoma, it's flat. The reason it's flat is because the glaciers smoothed the land out, and particularly after the, after the last glaciers, it was very, very smooth. The drainage ditch of the glaciers, the, re the remaining drainage ditch, is the Mississippi River. It go it's the lowest point. It's called the Mississippi River Valley. And from the east coast to the west coast, you have high altitudes, and then, and then if you could look at it planar, then you would see the fact that it all, the, the land dips into what is now the Mississippi River, which was the original drainage ditch of the glaciers. So I'm going to go with that. These big, powerful mammoth animals, which dominated the, the, the face of the earth for millions of years, all of a sudden became extinct. Well, hello, surprise, and how do you do? We finally have something on board that can bring the extinction of humankind. 
we never thought we'd see the day. And we saw many movies about outbreaks of epidemics, biological warfare, etc. But that would be on select communities. This is over the whole face of the earth. So finally, there's something in existence that could potentially wipe out the humans. So, like, okay, we've always wondered what wiped out the dinosaurs. We couldn't come up with that. We got just theories, but we got, we definitely have something here pinpointed. Ta da! Pinpointed. <coughs> that really gives significance to the fact that we know what potentially could wipe out the human race, and that's COVID 19, which was created in a lab. Now, whether it was an accident, or whether this was biological warfare, I got people who, uh, who think all kind of things uh, all across the board, but this is, a, this is a free think tank here. Shouldn't use that word, but I'm doing it anyway. A little bit of this and a whole lot of that. Supposing, theoretically, that after Mr. Trump came up with this... Uh, adding tariffs on the Chinese goods. Oh, God forbid, the Chinese in revenge released this COVID-19, which we know and confirmed was invented in a lab on the face of the industrial world. Changed our lives forever. Forever. This generation is not going to recover from this. I mean, there'll be survivors. There'll be those of us who still live. But I don't think life is going to be any different. I mean, it's like, oh, man, let's bring back our Native American brothers who, who survived after the dinosaurs were gone on the land. On planting and cropping and harvesting and hunting and, you know, and they did plenty okay for a long time, man, until, until a colonization occurred. So, but... That's neither here nor there. We are here. The colonists are here. The United States is here. We're all part of this big old thing. We're all part of the this epidemic, this pandemic. And it and it feels like we're, you know, I don't know about you, but it's like when I go shopping, I'm 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 afraid. I'm definitely afraid, man. I put that mask on. I wash my hands and stuff like that. But it's like you know, my friends that I usually see and. I, shake hands with, or give a big hug to, or whatnot. I can't do that no more. You know, they're, they're, they're seen as the enemy. They're seen as the threat. They're seen as the potential carrier of COVID-19 that could kill me. My friends, my good friends, all of our good friends, and some of our family, unless we know for sure that, you know, they, didn't, they don't have it or they didn't have it. Wow, you know. I was at a... a socially spaced gathering last night where Adam Baskins were listening to music on a porch, but at the same time, it's like, you know, these are my friends, I'm talking to them, I got a mask on, they got a mask on, we feel like we're at a, a hospital in the midst of a, a serious operation. So it's a, it's a mad world that we live in. The, the reality is here, it feels like I'm in a twilight zone, like I'm in a Twilight Zone episode, and we're just like, you know, waiting for the commercial break or waiting to get to the end of the show, where the resolve is, but it's not there yet. I feel, though, that the light is up at the end of the tunnel, because this uh, company called Merck came up with um, a statement that said that they tested their... Uh, uh, immune immune system uh, medicine on 50 people. 50 people. And they all created antibodies. But they can't release that because it needs more testing. Meanwhile, thousands and thousands of uh, people all around the world actually are dying. You know, we, we, we turn, tune into the news and hear the numbers. The United States is spiking. 
Europe is like banning all the, the uh, people from the United States from coming over there. For what? Initially, we were banning the Europeans. They got their act together, particularly in England and, and uh, New Zealand and other places like that. They, uh, the, the people are on board. The citizens are on board. But here, it's like some people want to wear a mask. Some people say, no, it's a, my constitutional right to not wear one. It's like, come on, this is only for a period of time. We brought... It was obvious that when we quarantined ourselves and put on the mask, we brought that we brought it down. We brought it down big time. It's just Americans, United States. I mean, uh, we're kind of spoiled. We want it now. We don't want to wait. We're not patient people. But in Europe, they started bringing it down. Now the ultimate is to have the vaccine. Okay. Uh, I read there's 150 companies that are developing vaccines. Only one announced that 50 of the people that they um, experimented on formed antibodies. It's already on a fast track because usually they start with rhesus monkeys, which we usually they usually test rhesus monkeys for years. But in this case, they went right to humans. So the next step for Merck is to test it on 30,000 people because they... Uh, that gives a demographic, a more uh, realistic demographic, because they have different strains. You got all kind of different people that have all kind of different blood types, and maybe it'll work on this person and not on that person. I say, I say, look, once they find something that works and they sure find got it, release it. At least it's going to save some of us. Um, the rest will just follow suit until they can develop more. In immune system type of medicines. Okay, well, before I get into my list of 10 inspirational things that kept us going after Katrina and or keep us going during COVID-19, I'm going to release a recipe, a gumbo recipe. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details. However, I'm going to give you the basics, and then because I don't want to go, I don't want to go specific, because everybody has a a variation on a gumbo that they make. Here's what you need: first, another little ditty. All right, this week's recipe is for a gumbo recipe: seafood okra gumbo. Again, okra is the African word for gumbo. We need okra, we need shrimps, we need a pound of uh, lump crab meat, olive oil, onion, garlic, fish stock, flour, and some filet. This usually comes in a round cylindrical bottle, filet, but don't forget the filet and bay leaves. They say whatever you do, start with a roux. But in this case, before you could start the roux, you got to take, you got to do a few things. One thing you got to do is like, take those shrimps, peel the shrimps, and start, the, start them on the boil. Take the okra, cut off the snip, cut off the tops, get rid of the tops, and then slice it up into different parts. Get that into a frying pan with some oil, with some olive oil, onion, and garlic, and you can add your filet there. And, with, and you got your shrimp boiling. You got those two things going. Then... Um, you stir and stir in that frying pan while you got the shrimps boiling um, your okra and you're going to put some water along with the seasons that I already mentioned and you're going to stir you got to stay with it now stay with it and then it's going to become gooey and oozy you just keep on stirring it's about five minutes high heat bring it down to medium or low and then you want that gooiness you see you want the gooiness meantime Keep checking on your shrimps. They're boiling. And when they turn pink, they should be ready. Um, so you can either throw them into the frying pan or into a bigger pot. I prefer a bigger pot. So once you've cooked down your okra and it's broken down and, and, it, and, and uh, you can see that it's starting to, that it's cooking and it's you know, ooze and it's gooey, gooey, gooey. And throw that in a pot. Now take that pot and put... Uh, Put olive oil on the bottom. Coat the bottom with uh, with olive oil. 
throwing at okra. No, wait. Stop the presses. We can't forget the root. Whatever you do, start with a root. Whatever you do, start with a root. So, here's what you're going to do. Yeah, the digger part, that's where you're going to make your root. Okay? So, you're going to put the olive oil in the big pot. Start it warming up. Not in a high heat. And then, you know, once you see, like, the olive oil kind of like sizzling, slowly but surely add some flour. And then stir it until it's brown. Then add that okra. Add that gooey, gooey, oozy, oozy okra. By this time, your shrimp should be um, parboiled, you know, where they're pink. Um, you want to... Uh, put them in a, uh, empty it out into a strainer because you know you want to, you don't want to put that water in there. Um, or maybe you do, but I would say no. I would say go ahead and strain your shrimp. Add the shrimp, add your lump crab meat, a little more garlic, a little more onion, some bay leaves, some filet, and uh, and just stir, stir, stir. Put some water. Cover it, let it boil. Start it out on a high heat, and when it boils, then put it on a low heat. Let it go for about 20 minutes, come back and check it, stir it. Check it about every five minutes, because you don't want it to burn. Okay, once, once you have that, all of those ingredients in that big pot boiling, start that rice. You might have already started your rice. You can have brown rice. I like it with brown rice. Everything with rice is nice, particularly brown rice. So, um, it's almost finished now. So, uh, once the rice is done, and you're going to be checking that gumbo, just keep on cooking it, cooking it, cooking it, cooking it. Let it all cook down. And, and you, so then it's going to be, you got your shrimp, you got your little crab meat, you might want to even put some real crabs. A lot of people like to put crabs. You can add some uh, undue sausage that you like, uh, you know, fried and sautéed. Like, you want to, like, you don't want to overcook this stuff, but at the same time, like, if you're going to use undue sausages, like, sauté it, and then put it in the pot. After about, I, I would have to say 30 minutes, maybe 40, 35 minutes, should be ready to go. It should be ready to go. I mean, that's how, that's hot, fresh. You want to cool it down. The whole the whole big pot, you see, can be put covered and put in the refrigerator. And then you just, if you buy yourself, you just pour out your portions as you need it. If you're going to be feeding your family, you know, then you just portion that out. It should be pretty delicious. All right, now we're going to move on to our next segment. This segment... It's called Inspirational Things That Kept Me Going After Katrina and or Keep Me Going During COVID-19. I actually solicited from my friends on Facebook this list. Some of them are repeat themselves. I'm going to try to get through as many as I possibly can with what limited time we have here. And hopefully there'll be an inspiration to you as well as to me. We're going to start at number, I would say, let's start at number 20 and go backwards. And we'll see how many we can get through. Number 20 is faith. Faith, I would have to say, in God is key and essential. Everything else is collapsed. Everything else is given way. I mean, we got to have money. Yes, that's number, you know, we got to have money in order to buy food to take care of ourselves. But we pray that God, in His goodness, provides for us, takes care of us. It's a good time to, to, have, to have faith in God so that we can get through this nightmare. Nineteen is nature. 
found, I've heard of a lot of people going out to uh, the park. Or uh, some people like to go fishing and get out in a boat by themselves and they get, a, get, the, get away from all of this stuff, man. Because it's like when you're in your boat by yourself, you know, in the middle lake or by your fishing, favorite fishing hole, you can take your mask off and just chill out. You know, as long as you're by yourself, there's nobody else out there. And just try to catch your fish and relax and, and just, get, you know, get, get a little break from it, this all. And come back with a load of fish, put on your mask when you come into the, to the population. Nature is, uh, nature is what we're talking about, walking and, and, and the sunshine and being around the flowers and the trees, a good park, you know, lakefront in New Orleans or any other place where you may be. Uh, nature is supportive of our immune system. That's the whole thing. It, it, in order to keep ourselves going, we, gotta, we have to maintain our strength, spirituality, mental, physical, spiritual, um, and, and um, nature enhances that. Okay, here we go with uh, a little bit more spirituality. Yoga meditation, okay, like focusing. You know, concentrating our energies. Again, that's something that helps the um, immune system. Here's something. Housework. Somebody put up housework. Housework is inspirational. So why not? You know, hey, you got time on your hands? Clean up your house. You know, a little bit of this and a whole lot of that. You know, one day do the bathroom, another day the kitchen. Or that, that little house project that you've been putting off. Now's the perfect time to do it since you got the time. Praying, okay, yeah, that's part of the equation. Praying by itself is not enough, but you gotta pray. Pray is pray prayer is the way we get in we we have our connectedness to, to God and the universe. Okay. I got a friend in California, she came up with uh, what what what's inspiration to her is researching conspiracy theories. <laughs> All right. Well, that'll that'll definitely burn up some time. Uh, and I'm never close to the idea that anything is possible nowadays. You know, particularly with the with the coronavirus. Did it? You know, was it? What is it? A, was it a form of biological warfare from the Chinese to get back to us for for? Uh, putting tariffs on the trade that they've been, on the goods that they've been selling us for years. Remember where everything was like coming out of Japan, made in Japan, you get something's made in Japan, now it's like made in China. A lot of the stuff looks good on the outside, the furniture, but then it's like, golly, man, it falls apart so good. It looks just as good as any American product, and it's cheaper. But then it's like, it, it doesn't last. It's faulty. You know, I got a friend of mine my husband goes to China each year to work on millionaire boats. They have a form of um, government over there. Now, underneath it all in China, it's they got it's hardcore communism, hardcore. But they got smart because what they did was they created their own government-controlled form of democracy. So it looks like they have a democracy, but it's with limitations. Uh, it was about 10 years ago I saw a documentary of a, of a man who ran a, uh, a work camp um, not too far from his house. And he was a Chinese millionaire. And uh, he'd go into the hillsides and then get all of these poor people and then offer them this. You get a place to stay, you get three square meals, and you get some, some money. Um, but it's basically almost like slave labor, really. But for them, it's like, hey, a step up. They had a place to stay. They had some food and also made some money. That was a step up. What was the product that this man was making? He was making Mardi Gras beads sold to New Orleans. Sold to all of the Mardi Gras crews in New Orleans. Most of our 99% of the Mardi Gras beads that we have that we throw from the floats. Who knows when that's going to be next if we could do that again. Tell me something, mister. <coughs> you look at those beads. You look at all those trinkets. Made in China, made in China, made in China, made in China. So this man was making $20 million a year 
And then they showed the sweatshop, and I was like, it had no, no safety regulations whatsoever. These poor people, man, exposed to all kind of chemicals and stuff like that, making these cheap plastic beads, which we get accelerated from, from catching or some of the other more creative trinkets. But, you know, uh, this, this one man was making $20 million just from, just from making Mardi Gras trinkets that sold to New Orleans. How about that? Wow. So I guess there's your conspiracy theory right there. Here's one, and I like this one, helping others. And that's duplicated. That was actually the number one thing that people uh, added, helping others. And I like that point. Helping others, what it does is it, um, it, can, it takes your mind off of yourself. And I guess nowadays we have to get creative in terms of helping others. I got a friend of mine. Um, she works for an organization here in New Orleans called Angels Place, and they work with the with people who are in dire straits and sep- uh, desperate situations. And she gives me a run to the grocery every couple of weeks. We both wear our masks. We stay socially spaced. We're good friends. Been on each other for a while. Gives me a run to the grocery, and then I make a contribution. But helping others, we have to be creative about the way we help others, whether that contribute money or, or help a neighbor, or make, a, make a grocery run for a neighbor, whatever. That takes, you, takes our mind off ourselves. It takes our mind and helps helping others. Like the focus goes elsewhere. To helping those who are perhaps in need or in not as good a place as we are. I think that that is pretty good. Then we have self-reliance, okay. This is a challenge, you know, it's like I find myself dialoguing with myself and I make my own little to-do list of things to do. I say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna wash the dishes, I'm gonna mop the floor, I'm gonna do this, do this before I go ahead and watch T V and treat myself, whatever. You know. And we have faith, we had faith already. God Almighty, God, of course. Got to have God. Some of us don't believe in God. We think in death. There is a God. Well, I would go with God, the creator God. You know, and I like the idea of connectedness. You know, like when we say prayers, we meditate, we pray, we pray for that connectedness, connectedness to the universal God to others and to ourselves, so the more, more harmony. And that it strengthens your immune system. Isn't that a thing? Music, listening to music. Music is good. Music is therapeutic. I used to be, uh, I used to major in, in music therapy. Music therapy is, uh, well, music in itself is therapeutic. It's creative. It opens you up, takes your mind off of things, and, and helps you be creative. Creativity, uh, I, that was not on the list, but I'm throwing it at, that in there myself. Creativity is very necessary. Um, there's an exercise I would recommend for everybody, and it's not a physical exercise. It's, a, it's a, an emotional, mental, spiritual exercise. It's called, it's called morning pages. And what it is, is this. And this is coming from like some therapeutic uh, authorities. You take five pages of paper, open pages, and you just start writing whatever comes to your mind. Whether if you're angry about something, write about that. If you're happy about something, write about that. Just start writing. You know, it could be, uh, oh, my sister, she gets on my nerves, whatever. You know, oh, my, my aunt, my wife, my kids, just start writing. And after about the, a page and a half, you're going to feel like a click inside, and it opens you up. And then just write as much as you can. Try to, try to do three pages, three full pages. And then you're going to feel like, you know, you're opening up inside. And this is, this is strengthened, because this is creativity. This is opening up yourself to, to your inner layers and to God, and the presence of God within you. And 
uh, try it. It's called Morning Pages. It's a, it's a viable exercise, spiritual exercise, mental exercise, emotional exercise. I recommend it to all. Okay, we have Jesus. Okay, Jesus. Um, I don't want to become preaching and stuff like that, but uh, for those of you that do believe in in uh, Christ Jesus the Lord, uh, that can help us in terms of our prayer and our connectedness to God. And uh, lastly, I'm going to leave it with, and this comes from my mother, talking to my son at least once a week. And, okay, so her son doesn't live in the house, but he, she likes to talk to him, and at least once a week. You know, so it's important to keep in, keep in touch with loved ones. Keep in touch with our family. Keep in touch with our friends. Even if it's like a conversation, a hello, it could be a Zoom, it could be a, uh, a check, it could be uh, a telephone call. Keep in touch with, keep in touch with loved ones. But, you know, God, family, and others. God, family, and friends. Like that, you know. Keep in touch. Have conversations with them. It's good for the heart. It's good for the mind. It's good for the soul. Okay. Uh, that's as far as this list goes. I've got more lists to go, but we're going to hold that for other, other weeks to come. Um, enjoy the gumbo. I didn't want to be too specific about it because everybody has their way of doing it. And you probably have your own recipe, but every week... Here in Uncle Jackie's Gum Bomb, start the show in a similar fashion. I'm going to give out the theme, and then we're going to do some kind of recipe. And after that, we're going to, you know, list things that, that, uh, that mean something to people. It's junk Jackie's, Uncle Jackie's Gum Bomb. And the week one. I hope that you've enjoyed the show. We hope that you've enjoyed the show. The loud and loud. And uh, hopefully we're going to keep this going. I'll be uh, posting things on, on the Facebook. And I'd like you to um, take time out. If you've got an idea for a show, for a theme show, um, drop me an email. My email is very simple. It's jackiegumbo at hotmail.com. It's all lowercase. J-A-C-K-I-E-G-U-M-B-O at hotmail.com. I've had a couple of, I've had a niece and a, and a friend want to jump in for a conversation, but right now we're not, uh, we're technically limited, so I can't record somebody on the phone just yet. In the future, we hope, hopefully going to build up to that. Well, this is Uncle Jackie from Uncle Jackie's Gumbo signing off now, wishing that the good Lord takes a liking to you. And we're going to see you all next time. Here's the closing song. You might remember it from the Roy Rogers show. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling until then. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling until then. Who cares about the weather? Everything is fine as well long as we're together. Happy trails to you till we meet again. And as Tennessee Ernie Ford used to say, bless your little pea-picking heart. <laughs>